Okay, let's uh, talk about dynamic optimization problems. Okay, and uh, the, the topic that we are going to study today is uh, known as maximum principle, uh, but we won't really study maximum principle from the maximum principle route, uh, which is the classical way of uh, proving this result. Uh, we'll come up with a proof using Lagrange multipliers and unconstrained optimization ideas, but but know that there are multiple ways of proving the result that uh, I'll be covering in today's class. Okay, so what is the setting? The setting is I have a state of the system. I have control action. Uh, let us for the time being assume that xt is in xt, which is a subset Rn and then ut lies in ut which is rm okay the reason why i'm writing it as ut and xt is because i want to give it a name which is the state space and action space so this is called the state space and this is known as the action space We have a performance index J, which which depends on the control actions we take until time t capital T equals capital T. So T equals one zero to capital T. So J is a performance index. It's a function of all the actions that we have taken in the past. And that is a function of a terminal function of x t plus one, which is the terminal state, and a running cost, so this is the terminal cost this is the running cost. Okay, and the goal is in this particular, uh, in what we are going to study today, the goal is to find u naught star ut star. That's the goal. Okay, we want to minimize minimize this performance index. This is the total cost. So minimize over u naught to ut of this particular performance index. So let's see why this problem is important. Let me give you a fairly uh, nice example. So let's say you you want to go to Mars from Earth. Okay, uh, There's no atmosphere, you'll probably die by the time you reach there. But let's say for the time being that you want to go to Mars or you want to send a spacecraft to Mars. So this is your Earth, this is Mars, and you want to land somewhere here, okay? This is your point x, x, x hat, okay, um, or x Mars. You want to land at this specific point, okay? So this is not a region, okay? This is not like a thousand mile cross thousand mile region where you want to land. This is a specific point on the planet where you want to land, okay? And here, here you are, okay? And you want to go from, from Earth to Mars. Now, how do you come up with the control action? Okay, so what is your state? Your state would be your x, y, z coordinate, let's say in the coordinate system of the solar, solar system. So, 
you have your XYZ coordinate, you can take control action, let's say you have a spaceship, you can move it around, okay, you can uh, add thrusters and so on, so you can go all the way to the space and then you can travel through the space and you can get to the Mars, okay, so there is some control action that you can take and, and that's your objective, you want to go from this point to Mars, so what would you do, okay, how would you find how would you cast that problem into a problem of, into an optimization problem? So you have the state transition equation. So how does your state transition given what actions you have taken? Okay, so you know that equation perfectly. But what should be your performance index? Okay, so let's say here is one possible performance index. So you say that this is, you know, I don't care what happens in the midway. All I want to do is at time t plus 1, capital T plus 1, I want to reach this point. Okay, so that's your, that's your goal. Then you say, well, no running cost. And what I'm going to do is take g, t, g capital T plus 1 of x t plus 1 as any thoughts, what should the performance index be? Any thoughts? Well, you can take, typically you take the quadratic performance index, xt plus 1 minus x Mars square, right? But then you know that this is a soft performance index, right? It, you, as long as you are close to x Mars, you are fine. So in that case, what you do is you want to get as close to x Mars as possible, so you multiply it by some big number, 10 raised to 6. Okay, so what this number will do is if you want to minimize this performance index, well, it's, it's just a constant multiple, right? So constant multiple doesn't mean much because you're solving the same problem. Let's say, so this is one performance index that you can take. The other performance index you can take is raised to 4. Okay, or raised to 6 or raised to 10. So you start with some performance index of this type and you kind of know that, you know, if I'm going to make it this xt plus 1 minus x mars raised to 10, I'm going to get as close to x mars as possible. That I'm, going to get. I'm going to get a trajectory, the control trajectory, or I'm going to, if I solve this problem with that particular choice of gt plus 1, I will, I'll be able to find u0, u1, u2, all the way up to ut, which will minimize this particular performance index. And what that means is you will be as close to x mars as possible, okay? As close to x mars as possible. What is going to constrain your action or what is going to constrain that performance index? Well, you have a state transition function, okay? So that will... You might, you might hit a zero, so your optimal cost might be equal to zero, or because of the state transition function, it might be something very close to zero, but not equal to zero. But you are fine with it. You, this is the point you want to land at. You're fine if you are, let's say, within 5, 10, 20, 30, or 100 meters of that particular point, okay? It's completely okay. Now your supervisor comes and tells you that you know what? You've given me a solution to this problem, but guess what? We need a lot of fuel for that in order to, in order to uh, implement these control actions that you have computed, okay? So then you think about it and you say, you know what? I can't really afford to take so much of fuel onto my spaceship because it's just too heavy. I mean, I won't be able to escape Earth's gravitational pull. So what do you do? Well. Then you say, guess what? I'm going to add a running cost. Okay, so then I'm going to add a running cost gt of xt comma ut, which is fuel consumption, which keeps track of the fuel consumption of the journey at time t. Okay? And then you add a running cost, 
and then you try and optimize and then you will get a you will get a set of control action which takes you close to this point x mars but it also minimizes the fuel consumption okay and then you can of course have some parameter so you can have your total cost j as some multiplier beta into gt plus 1 plus summation gt okay and you can adjust this parameter beta depending upon whether you want to get closer to x mars or whether you want to minimize the fuel consumption. So if beta is very, very small, your uh, cost function penalizes the fuel consumption more. If your beta is very, very large, you don't really penalize the fuel consumption as much, but you want to get to x mars, uh, you want to get as close to s x mars as possible. Okay, so that's the idea, that's the rough idea of what you can use this theory to do. Of course, there are people in uh, Center for Automotive Research, and maybe some of you might be doing research in other areas, where you are trying to minimize the fuel consumption of a vehicle which is running on the road, in which case UT is the amount of fuel injected into the engine, and XT is probably the speed of the vehicle and the grade of the road and so on. Okay, So it's quite heavily used in various applications. And so today what we are going to do is study one way of computing this U0 to UT star. Any questions so far? Okay, so what we have here is a problem in which there is only terminal cost and you could also have a problem where you have a terminal cost and a running cost. Okay, so let's focus on the problem where you have only a terminal cost. There's no running cost, so GT equals zero for all time t. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do is you see, one thing that you should note is, well, x naught is given. One thing that you will see is that I've written the performance index purely as a function of u naught to ut. What happens to xt? What happens to xt? Why, why am I not writing it as a function of xt? It's because it's already in here, right? So in fact, what you can do is you can determine the entire sequence of xt is just by knowing u0 to ut. How is that possible? Well, x1 equals f of, well, f, uh, x1 equals f0, x0 comma u0. Let me write it as phi 0 of u, uh, where I define my u as u vector as u0 ut. And I'm going to write my x2 as f1 of x1 and u1, which is the same as f1 of f0 of x0, u0, u1. And I'm going to define it as phi1 of u, and so on. Okay, so I can write each of these x's purely as a function of u. Okay. Of course, x0 is there, but x0 is a fixed constant, so we don't really keep track of what x0 is. x0 is the initial state. Okay, so I can write each state, xt, I can write xt as, as a function phi t uh, applied on the entire vector u. Of course, phi 0 only uses u0, phi 1 only uses u1, phi t only uses uh, ut. But it's a, it's a compact way to write this class of function. So let's talk about approach 1 to solve this problem.
So treat it, treat this problem as an unconstrained problem. So you want to minimize j of u over all possible u which is given as g capital T plus 1 p t plus 1 u. Oh, there is only a terminal cost, right? There is no running cost. So no running cost. Yeah. Only if your cost function, uh, if your cost function penalizes distance, then yes, it will be the shortest path. Fin final point. Uh, let's defer the talk about shortest path we will get to it uh, in the next class okay so for shortest path problems you have to study what is known as dynamic programming so this class of algorithms probably won't give you shortest path kind of difficult um, okay so uh, this is uh, so this is an unconstrained minimization problem. So what do we know for, for unconstrained minimization problem? What's the first order necessary condition? If u star is optimal, then gradient over uh, gradient of j with respect to u is going to be equal to 0, evaluated at u star. Okay, so all we need to know is what does this gradient look like? Okay, we want to come up with a compact form of writing this gradient. Uh, come up with a compact form to write this. Okay. So that's what we are going to do in the next uh, few minutes. So first of all, I want to ask you, let's say I have a function. Uh, this is different from these f and g, so I need to come up with function. Okay, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. Let's say I have three functions, h1 of h2 of h3 of x. Okay, and I want to differentiate it with respect to x. What would I get? Anyone knows what this differentiation looks like? Well, you take the h3 prime x, then you take h2 prime evaluated at h3 x, then you multiply it by h1 prime evaluated at h2 evaluated at h3 of x okay this is known as the chain rule okay and something similar works in the vector case as well so let's look at what is the gradient of j with respect to u capital t Okay, we'll just apply this chain rule thing. So I have gradient of u capital T, P capital T plus 1, U multiplied by gradient of xt plus 1, gt plus 1.
So what should this be equal to? So let's, uh, let's try and write what phi t plus 1 of u bar is. Well, this is equal to gradient of u t. What is, what is the gradient? So the gradient is f t of x t u t into gradient of x t plus 1 g t plus 1. Okay, because phi t plus 1 can also be written in this form where x t actually does not depend on u capital T. So, x t does not depend on u t, but u t of course, there you see a u t here that depends on u t, but this number x t here actually is independent of u t. So, we can treat this as a constant in this case. So, what do I get? Gradient of u t f t multiplied by gradient of g t plus 1 of well gradient of g t plus 1 with respect to x t plus 1. Okay, so, this is what I get as the gradient. So, this is the gradient of j with respect to u capital T. Any questions so far? Questions? Okay, so this is clear. This is just chain rule, but in matrix form. Okay, this is a. This is something that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. This is the chain rule for scalar case, but you can carry over the same set of arguments for the vector case as well. And so, if you think about it, gradient of u t j of u, this is a vector in R m, right. Let us look at the dimension of gradient of u t f t, this is a vector in what? Any thoughts? What is this a vector in? M cross N, <coughs> right? Because X is, remember, X is N dimensional and U is M dimensional, okay? So this is the dimension of U multiplied by the dimension of X. And if you look at gradient of XT plus 1, GT plus 1, this is a vector in N dimensional. Okay, so, as you can see, by multiplying these two matrices, you get a vector in Rm, okay, and that is what is the gradient of J at ut. So, dimensionally, this formula is correct. It seems to make sense. Although, I am not saying that you should just check the dimensions and that is a proof, okay, but it says that our intuition is right. Okay. Probably our intuition is probably right. Okay, you still need to probably think about this expression more carefully to convince yourself of the fact that it is indeed true. Now, if you look at a general u u t of j of u, this will be written of in this form: gradient of u t f t multiplied by gradient of x t plus 1, okay. So, this is the general formula. Of course, when this t is equal to capital T, then all you have is gradient of u capital T, f capital T, and then uh, gradient of g t plus 1. 
the terminal cost. Okay, so this is the general case. Uh, you can prove it by induction, or if you are quick, you can prove it by inspection. Okay, let's try to prove it by democratic means. How many of you think that this formula is true? Okay, no one? <laughs> Come on, I want to prove it by democratic means, okay? Everyone should vote for this formula is true. Then I can proceed. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to spend time deriving this formula. Uh, so now I'm going to do proof by intimidation, okay? This is the formula, okay? You should all remember this. It'll be there in your exams, okay? So if you think about it, this is our m cross 1, m cross n, this is our n cross n, all of these is our n cross n and then this one is our n cross 1, okay? So dimensionally it makes perfect sense. Okay, so what am I, what I am going to do is, I am going to define this multiplication of a sequence of matrices, I'm going to define it as Pt plus 1, oh P, should I define it as Pt or Pt plus 1? Pt plus 1. Okay, so what I have is, let me define P capital T plus 1 as gradient of X T plus 1 G T plus 1. So that's my terminal, I'll call this a co-state vector, co-state vector. And so this will be my terminal co-state vector and I'm going to define the recursion Pt equals gradient of x t plus 1 f t plus 1 multiplied by P t plus 1. Okay, so that's the recursion for co-state vector. As you can see, the co-state vector is defined in a backward fashion. So you define the co-state vector for the final time, t plus one, uh, first, and then you define pt recursively in this fashion. You know, there doesn't, there seems to be something wrong in this expression. What is wrong? So let's look at P capital T plus 1, that's this. Then what is P capital T? That's gradient of XT FT multiplied by PT plus 1. Oh, I see. This is wrong. Now it makes perfect sense. Okay, so Pt equals gradient of Xt multiplied by Ft plus, oh, this is a matrix, no. This is also a matrix multiplication. Okay, so this makes, this is the correct equation for the co-state vectors. So what I have done is, I want to compute this gradient of J with respect to UT. It's a long multiplication of matrices, so I want to come up with a compact notation so that I can write it easily. And so this is the co-state vectors that I've introduced, which is PT plus one is the gradient of the terminal cost, and then PT is gradient of the state transition function with respect to XT multiplied by the co-state vector at the next time step. Now with this notation, you can convince yourself that 
the gradient of j with respect to ut is given by gradient of f with respect to ut multiplied by pt plus 1 okay so that's a short way compact way of writing this gradient any questions where small t well see capital t is the terminal time okay so that's the time when your decision stops your decision making stops if you remember the state equation was xt plus 1 equals ft xt ut t was t goes all the way from 0 to capital t okay and your x0 which is the initial condition is specified it's a constant so the temperature it let's say you want to control the temperature of this room for the next 24 hours the temperature right now is a constant it's given right so that's the initial state okay and you are and this t is 24 hours okay so 0 hour 1 hour 2 hour 3 hour all the way up to 24 hours so this is this is capital t plus 1 okay so at the end of 24th hour you will have x capital t plus 1 okay so that's this x t plus 1 the final state and this is the final terminal this is the terminal cost right so we don't have running cost in this particular example we only have a terminal cost and then once i define what happens as the final stage or what the costate vector is at the final stage then i define t so this t runs from 0 to capital t okay whenever i write small t it means it's running from 0 to capital t okay but in this case since i'm defining it recursively you should think of t going from capital t all the way to zero okay, because we are going in the reverse direction this is t plus 1 and this is t that's how we have defined it same thing here this gradient of ut requires pt plus 1 uh, to define so if i look at this expression what do i have well gradient of j with respect to every ut has to be equal to 0 so what i have is define pt plus 1 equals to gradient of xt plus 1 gt plus 1 and then pt equals gradient of xt ft multiplied by pt plus 1 i define my pt plus 1 and gt this is all evaluated at the optimal points okay so whatever x 1 star u 1 star sorry x x not u not star x1 well let me not write it in terms of x not and x1 let me just write it as u star let me put a star here as well because then you know that it's the costate vector corresponding to the optimal trajectory so i define if i define it this way then all i have to say is well gradient of ut ft evaluated at u star multiplied by p star t plus 1 is equal to 0 for all t equal 0 to capital t okay so this is the this is the necessary condition for optimality okay 
Now, if your cost function is convex, if j is convex in u, then this is also sufficient, right? So, in many cases, you have a linear system with a convex cost. So, if the original system is linear, which means ft here is a linear function of xt and ut, and this gt plus 1 was a convex function, then this is also a sufficient condition for optimality. But in general, it's only a necessary condition. I don't think uh, most of the systems that you would encounter would be a linear system. Okay? In most cases, it will be a nonlinear system, in which case the convexity is lost because you are acting on the system again and again. So the convexity, so J will no longer be convex because your original system was nonlinear. Okay? But for linear system, this theory is very well studied and it also will be sufficient for linear systems only, okay, but for nonlinear systems it may not be sufficient, even though your cost function might be convex. Okay, is that is that something that you understand? You see it? Okay, so if this is linear, then this is linear, and therefore you have a convex function composed with a linear function, so that leads to a convex function. Okay, but if Ft was nonlinear, then this convexity will be lost in the process. Okay, so J will no longer be a convex function of U. Okay, so that gives us a compact way of figuring out. So if, if you give me a U star and you claim that it is optimal, all I have to do is compute the optimal trajectory. So I'll compute X1 star, X2 star, X3 star, all the way to Xt plus 1 star. I'll evaluate these co-state vectors in a recursive format. So I'll find the co-state vector at the final time step, and then I'll plug it in here and find the co-state vector at all previous time steps. And then I have to check whether this condition holds or not. If it does not hold, then you are telling a lie. It's not an optimal solution. If it does hold, then I have to go to the second order sufficient condition to ascertain that what you have claimed is indeed true. Okay, So if it is locally optimal, then it has to satisfy the second order sufficient condition. Okay, So that's one way of thinking about this problem. Alternatively, you can also think about this problem by, by adding this term, this equality uh, relationship as a constraint to the original optimization problem. Okay, So let's see if we get something different if we do that. Okay. So now what I'm going to say is, well, I want to minimize gt plus 1 of xt plus 1 over all u0 to ut such that f1 or f0 x0 u0 minus x1 is equal to 0, f1 x1 u1 minus x2 equals 0, f capital T xt ut Okay. How many variables are there in this problem? Independent variables. So remember in this case u this u thing was the only independent variable, right? Everything else was I mean the entire dependence of xt on ut and everything was taken care of by this function. So uh, so this final cost was completely a function of u alone. In this case, the, how many independent variables do we have here? Any thoughts? I mean, of course, u0 to ut are independent variables because we are optimizing over that. What about x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xt plus 1? 
Well, you see, they are also independent variables, but they are bound by these equality constraints. Okay? So now, instead of solving an unconstrained optimization problem, now you are solving an optimization problem with t constraints, okay? or t plus 1. How many constraints are there? t plus 1 constraints. So that was approach one. So this is approach two. Uh, it's a constrained optimization problem. Okay. It's a constrained optimization problem, and we have t plus 1 constraints, and we have t plus 1 variables here, and then we have t plus 1 variables here. Okay, so two t plus 1 variables with t plus 1 constraints. What do we know about constrained optimization problems? Well, under sufficient regularity conditions, I mean, under regularity conditions, there exist Lagrange multipliers that will solve, that will be. So let's let's look at the Lagrangian. So what is my L of L of u and p? Okay, where I define p as the Lagrange multiplier p p one to p t plus one. Okay, that's my Lagrange multiplier. So so the Lagrangian will be g t plus one plus P T transpose F T minus one Yeah F T minus one X T minus one U T minus one minus X T and then I have to sum over all T T equals zero to capital T. Am I missing some term here? I think so. Yes, now it makes perfect sense. Okay, so this is my Lagrangian. Okay, so what do I know about L? So if u star is optimal, where do I write? I want to get some, let me write it here. So if, if u star is optimal and regular, so just assume that regularity conditions are satisfied in this case. So if u star is optimal and regular, then there exists p star such that what? What should happen at p star? This L is actually a function of x as well, and nobody pointed that out. I'm sad. Okay. Okay, so L is a function of x as well. So there exists p star such that what should happen? Sorry? Gradient with respect to what? Gradient of xt of L should be equal to 0 and gradient of ut of L should be equal to 0 for all t, right? Because those are the independent variables here. Right? X is independent variable, U is independent variable, P is the Lagrange multiplier. So this is what we have. So let's try to find what the gradient of L with respect to XT is.
what is the gradient of L with respect to XT? So let's say what is the gradient of L with respect to XT plus 1, capital XT? Well, I have gradient of X T plus 1, G T plus 1 minus P T plus 1 equals to 0. Right? What is this equation equal to? Right? So we, we get the same equation in both cases. So here P star T plus 1 is equal to the gradient of G T plus 1. Here also we have P star T plus 1 is equal to the gradient of G T plus 1. Right? So we get the same expression no matter which approach we take. Now if you look at gradient of X T of L, what do you get? Well, the first term is independent of, so GT plus 1 is independent of XT, so that is equal to 0. So I have 0 plus I'll have PT transpose minus XT. So what's the gradient with respect to XT? That will be minus PT. Okay, and then I'll have plus P star T plus one. Well, gradient of X T plus one F of T plus one multiplied by P star T plus 1. Okay, and this should be equal to 0. Okay, and this was the second equation that I deleted. That was this equation. Okay, so P star T is going to be equal to gradient of FT plus 1 multiplied by P star T plus 1. Okay, so if you continue this way, you will find that the gradient of UT with respect to L is exactly equal to this expression. So this is gradient of UT of L. Okay, that's this expression. So no matter which approach you take, whether you look at it in the lower dimensional space where you have t plus 1 independent variables and an unconstrained optimization problem, if you look at it in that space, you get the same set of equations. Or alternatively, you can say, you know what, I'm just going to treat them as equality constrained. Okay, and you look at a higher dimensional space where u0 to ut are independent variables, and then x1 to xt plus 1, they are also independent variables. Okay, and you get the same set of expressions. Wasn't it uh, gradient x of t f t not x of t plus 1 f t plus 1 on our previous result? So let's look at this expression. So I have, let's rewrite it. I have PT transpose F T minus 1 X T minus 1 U T minus 1 minus X T and then I have to look at PT plus 1. So I'll have plus PT plus 1 transpose F T, oh you are right. You are right. So this should be XT and this should be FT. So what do I have now? So this is independent of XT. So this term, differentiation of this will be 0. This will be minus identity. So that's minus P star T. And then I have differentiation with respect to XT is going to be 0. And only this term will remain. And that's differentiation of XT, differentiation of FT with respect to XT multiplied by P star T plus 1. Okay, so that's right. Okay, thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so th we should have the gradient of FT with respect to XT here instead of T plus 1. So no matter which route you take, you get the same set of expressions. Okay.
So those are two different ways by which you can view it. You can view it as an unconstrained problem. You can view it as a constrained problem. If you view it as a constrained problem, then the co-state vectors turns out to be the Lagrange multipliers for this set of constraints. Uh, if you think of it as an unconstrained problem, then the co-state vectors are just multiplication of some derivatives. Okay? They don't have any physical meaning. But as you can see, looking at these two approaches side by side, you kind of see that there is a lot of rich ideas just by looking at this problem. You can either view it in a smaller dimensional space or you can view it as a larger dimensional space problem. Okay? And both of them will lead you to the same result. Now what happens if you have running cost? What do you do with when you have a running cost? Any thoughts? So now that we have studied this problem with terminal cost, can we do something, can we play some mathematical trick so as to be able to use this result without any, without doing more math, okay, without going through entire list of expressions again. Okay, so this is a fairly old idea, which is to somehow augment the cost, the running cost as a state in the original set of equations. So how do we do that? So let's look at the expression. So I define my xt plus 1 as some function of xt comma ut and I define yt plus 1 as yt plus gt xt ut. Okay, so now I have xt plus 1, yt plus 1 is some f tilde of xt, yt and then ut. Okay, this is known as augmenting the state space, augmenting the state space. This is purely mathematical trick, okay, there is no physics behind it. Okay, this is a mathematical trick to make our life easy. So, so after we have figured it out, what is the terminal cost? So my terminal cost will be or J of u is equal to the original terminal cost plus what else? Y p e plus 1. Okay. So in fact, even this if you think about it is is a function is a function of the state vector that you started with okay so the summary is we solve the problem with terminal cost then we said, well, now we have a running cost, what do we do? So the mathematical trick was, well, let's augment the state space. Okay, let's augment that, let's add a new state which keeps track of the running cost. I will take y0 to be equal to 0. Okay, so these keep, keeps track of the running cost and then I will add the final state to the final cost, final terminal cost. And that will give me the new cost. And these two problems, this problem which has only a terminal cost is equivalent as an optimization problem. This problem is equivalent to the original problem where we had a running cost and we had the state equation. Okay? We had only xt equation, we didn't have any yt. So in the next class, we will talk about 
what is the first order necessary condition for this class of problems uh, and then we will talk about maximum principle okay thank you guys i'll see you next week <laughs>